All right. David Coggins, welcome back to the show. Fred, it's great to be here. So we had you on way back in 2017, talk about your yes. book, uh, How to Develop Your Sense of Style. And then we had you on again. That's episode number 282 for those who want to check that out. Then we had you again on again in 2018 to talk about Men and Manners, your book. Um, so yeah, you're, you're kind of like the style etiquette guy, but you've got a secret. You're also, yes. a, you're also an avid fly fisherman. How, when, did you st- when did you start fly fishing? When did it become your passion? Well, a long time, actually. We've, I grew up in Minneapolis, and we have a cabin on a lake in Wisconsin, and it's a really special place. And so I would, I would go out and fish from a boat, just row out and fish in a very conventional way for largemouth bass. And then I started to fly fish probably when I was 20 or so and kind of became addicted in my, in my 20s. So 20, 20 years of the hard stuff. And it's sort of, it, it, it was a little bit of a secret and now it's, it's less of a secret. All right. So those who aren't familiar with fly fishing, how does it differ from just like spin fishing? Like you were talking about, you just go to a boat and just drop a line. What's the difference? Well, it's not the direct way to get from point A to point B. You're going to catch more fish spin fishing, which is just the first thing to know about it. It's not really very efficient, but that doesn't mean it's not good. It's uh, when you're spin fishing, the weight of the lure carries itself out to to wherever you're fishing in when you're fly fishing you need to get generate line speed which that famous sort of back and forth cast and then kind of delicately unfold a cast to a trout typically that's how the sport began and that that means it's a little more poetic it's a lot more sensitive maybe it's more like squash if spin casting is more like racquetball there's a little more nuance and uh, and I, I enjoy that very much and i think a lot of people get caught up in all that and that that can be a good thing and then within fly fishing, there's also different ways to fly fish as well. So what are yes. the different ways you can fly fish? Well, traditionally, you're imitating the hatch of a, of a mayfly, which, which usually happens every day. And so trout come and rise to eat those insects. And so it's the, the kind of the platonic ideal of the sport is to cast upstream and to let this the drift of your imitation fly float down towards a fish that's eating. And as it kind of lingers over where you know that fish to be, because you've watched it eat, it, it comes up and takes the fly. And that moment is incredibly exciting. That's sort of the, the, what, what everybody wants to happen. Unfortunately, like trout don't always do that. They don't always rise. And so you have to make some decisions about if you want to leave the pinnacle of the sport and go down to where the fish are, and then you can nymph, which is where you have a sinking fly. And some people like that because they catch more fish doing that. And other people sort of stick with their principles and always remind you that they're sticking with their principles to fish (laughs) on the surface. If you were in England, for instance, you had on some of the great famous chalk streams, you're only allowed to fish on, on the surface with the dry fly. Then other people could fish with something called a streamer, which you strip in. That would be a little bit more like conventional fishing. A streamer kind of imitates a minnow or something like that and darts and large fish come and eat it if you're lucky. And some people like that too, because that's how they catch large fish. But every one of these approaches is informed by by your own theories and your own personality. And so you tell me how you like to fish and I can tell you something about your personality. Oh, okay. So if I said, <laughs> so if like if someone said, I, I just do the surface, nothing else, yes. what does that say? But like, is that, is that you? Is, are you just a surface fisher guy? Well, so it kind of changes as you get older, doesn't it? The same way all sorts of things change. Like if you, sometimes you want to catch a fish a certain way because it's the most difficult way. And that satisfaction is really, is really nice. And other times you're like, forget that. I want some action. I want to catch more fish. And so then you want a nymph. And that go down below the surface. And sometimes you say, I just want to catch one, the largest fish I can catch, and I'll do whatever I can to get that. And so one thing that's interesting about fishing is you it you want different things at different times in your life. The same way you might like an album from a band when they're playing electric, and you might like it when Dylan goes acoustic. And you at one point that really upset you, but then as you get older, you're like, you know, actually that sounds pretty good. And I think one thing that's wonderful about fly fishing is that it, it provides an insight into a different window of your life and your expectations and what you want from that time in your life. So like right now in your time of life right now, so what you're in your forties, I imagine. 
I'm in my forties. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, what, where do you, so every you... time I do anything technological that works, it's a miracle. Every time I can get on a zoom <laughs> call that that's the age I'm on where I'm surprised that it works. I, you know, I like to, I like to fish with a dry fly. I, I usually go through a progression. So I start with the principled way. That's like the dry fly. And I try to convince a trout to come up and take that fly. And then I can handle that for an hour and a half, <laughs> you maybe a couple hours. And then I'm like, okay, now I'm getting a little frustrated here. You know, your principles shift over time. It depends if you're with someone or on your own or in new water or at a place you visit a lot. So I like to, I like a dry fly. That's, that's my favorite thing to do, but sometimes you, you want a little action and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I don't look down on anybody who nymphs. I mean, the people who catch the most fish typically nymph because most of what a trout eats are nymphs. And so I sometimes like to do that too. And if you do that, that can be pretty exciting. I think one thing just to say about most trout fishing is that it's very, and most fly fishing is that it's visual and often on the surface. So you see the fish come and take the fly and that's really exciting. I mean, that is, I, I don't care who you are, like that, that gets you going. And so you've got a sport that in many ways is, is very methodical, very peaceful, very rhythmic, very soothing, but then it's punctuated by these bursts of action and extreme excitement. And it's very bracing. And so those long periods of waiting kind of give shape to those moments of action and excitement. And you can't really have one without the other. Right. I mean, what I like about the, your book is that you you do it indirectly. You don't do it like, this is a lesson for life. But when, <laughs> right. as you read it, you're like, oh, I can see how this applies to other aspects of my life. And I've been there where like, sure. there's, I have like these principles. Like, I'm going to do this because like, this is the way you're supposed to do it. But then right. eventually it's like, well, no, actually I want to get this thing done. So I'm going right. to do things to get this done, even though it's not the the right way to do it. Well, it's like, did you ever have a manual transmission car? And when I did, and I my first car was that, and I thought, I will only ever drive a manual. And that was a big deal. And then my next car miraculously was that too. And I'm like, yes, my manual transmission sob. And I felt you know, very virtuous and connected to everything I was doing. And that's a little bit like fishing with a dry fly. It's more difficult, but you feel very connected. And then you finally, like, they don't really make many of those cars anymore. You get an automatic and you're like, you know what? This isn't so bad. Maybe that's nymphing. Sometimes you want to try other things. And I think, I think fly fishing, you know, fishing lends itself to metaphors and that's both a blessing and a curse, (laughs) you know, the one that got away and a thousand things and Moby Dick and all the rest of it. And I think, but uh, some of those metaphors do apply. And I think it really, fly fishing allows you to kind of understand because it's often done in solitude it it allows you to kind of assess and because it's often you're not catching anything (laughs) and so it off it offers you a chance to assess something about yourself like what first of all the pleasures of being alone but also what you need what you demand and expect from something that you care about i do that with starting a fire i'll try to do it just like the the boy scout way i want to get my tinder my kindling (laughs) and then eventually it's like no all right where's the fire starter we got to get this going we got to we got to roast marshmallows (laughs) no i mean and that's why there's like there's that it also depends if you're alone or with your friends right and then if you're like no i'm going to do this in a very pure way and then other times no one's looking and you're like put in the uh the fire you know the um lighter fluid on there when when people are away and they're like what's that smell and you're like i don't know i just I don't know. Uh, I mean, this is a, this is a big fire though, right? This is awesome. Right, exactly. <laughs> so what I love, you, this book is, is sort of your education as an angler and it mm, goes over decades. Exactly. And as I read it, I was like, man, I want to become, a, I want to become a fly fisherman. And I think a lot of people, like they'll, they'll watch a river runs through it and they're like, man, I sure. want to become, they, they love the idea of fly fishing because it's romantic, but very few people become obsessed like you. And I think I'm, I'd be one of those people like, I think it, I like the idea, but I don't know if I actually, if I do it, I'd probably be like, yeah, not for me. Well, it, it does take, unfortunately for a wonderful sport, there's a serious learning curve and, and the cast is a kind of a, a stumbling point for many people. And the cast, the fly cast is a huge part of a river runs through it. And he talks about his father's, you know, between a motion between 10, 10 and two o'clock. And, and I out tell people, And this can reassure them or frighten them, but there's so much more than the cast. You want to get your fly out there and have it delicately land on the water. But then there's so many other things beyond that, which is kind of making it drift down the river in a natural way. If a fish comes using your hand-eye coordination and and kind of being steady to, to 
set the hook and fight a fish. And all of that comes together in a beautiful place, in a beautiful setting, usually with people you like. And that, and there's a lot to be said for that. To get to that point requires some doing, you know, and I think that that's, that's a challenge. And I think that's a challenge worth doing for anybody, no matter what the thing they care about is, it's often not easy to get to a point where you're in control of the skills that are at stake. And I, I also tell people fishing is more than just the fishing. You know, if we go out together, it starts in the morning and we, we stop at a diner in Montana and we kind of have hash browns and we, we drive to the river and there's a, the feel a certain sense of anticipation as we put together our rod and assemble the rod and make our tactical decisions and, and anything could happen in the day and we feel great about it. And then of course, you know, we kind of maybe get our asses kicked and don't catch anything, but right before lunch, you do catch something and then that's great. And you have a beer. And then you fish in the afternoon and go back to the bar afterward and sit around a campfire at night. And all those things together are the fishing, the not catching it, the hopefully the triumph, the the communal feeling you have with someone you care about when you when he thrives or you you have success. And all that together to me is the experience. The same way if you go to a great, if you go to the opera, maybe you get dressed up and you look forward to it and you study it ahead of time so you know what's going on. Maybe you fall asleep during it. Who knows what happens? But it's not, in, you can't isolate the part of fishing where it's not just the cast or even catching the fish. It's all of these things together. And I hope to make the case in the book that, that the, the, those things make a complete experience that can really happen all over the world and be really special and, and, and kind of meaningful in your life. No, I like that. Think, I mean, the guys are reading like eating hash browns in Montana. That sounds awesome. And then again, like going in, this is like, there's a metaphor for life. That's how a lot of things in life, it's not just like a right. party, but it's like getting ready for the party. That's a lot of, of fun, course. Right. Well, if you, th- if you think about like going to a baseball game with your dad, when you were a boy, like there might, there's so much more, maybe it's like crossing, like entering the stadium and buying a scorecard, or you, maybe you got to have like that soft pretzel. That's the only place you ever had it. Like, and you, and you see the green, the first time you come out of the, the gangway and to see the field for the first time and all those things mixed together. And then of course you want to see the home team win and your heroes prevail, but it, it's all of that coming together. And you know, the book takes place, like every chapter is a different place around the world. And I think what's interesting is all of these, whether it's Montana or Patagonia or the Bahamas or Canada, each of these places have their own cultures. So they have their own bad beers and their own food and their own way the guides are and their own landscapes and their own different fish, of course, with different flies and different tactics. And so you can kind of fall in love with fishing in diff- a different place in different ways and al- also get humiliated in all these places. You may be an expert trout fishing in Montana, and then you try to go bone fishing in the Bahamas and you're like, wait a minute, this is completely different. There are a few of the similar principles, but it's almost like you're starting over again, which is humbling and exciting because then you can fall in love again too. So uh, let's talk about some of these places that you highlight yeah. in the book, part of your your education as an angler. And along the way, I think what we I'd like to do is, you know, maybe give people a taste of fly fishing, but also you know, kind of suss out those life lessons that you, mm, that, sure. that I got from when I was, as I was reading this. And one of the big ones that I got was the importance of mentors. And you start off the mm. book talking about, you know, in Wisconsin, when you're in your 20s, you started getting into fly fishing and you fell into these two old guys, kind of <laughs> yeah. took you under their wing and taught yeah. you the ropes. So who were these these guys? Well, they were friends of my grandfather, and my grandfather, his name is Walter, was a law professor and not really an outdoorsman, though he loved the natural world. And there were these two men who were kind of legendary figures on the lake. One's name was Carter, who was a rationalist, very specific in how he did everything. And the other's name was Dave, who was not like that at all, was a very willful person. And I think I was intimidated by them when I was a boy. And my grandfather always said, you should go fishing with them. And I just, I was, uh, I wasn't smart enough to know to be with these guys who were incredible, serious, world-class anglers. I mean, it was my incredible good fortune, my idiocy to not see them sooner when I was young, but my good fortune to start going out with them later. Basically, they just needed someone to, to go on the canoe with them. And I learned, a, because fish, fly fishing is learned, you, you do need someone to help you. In a perfect world, it's your dad or a, an uncle or your whomever it is, grandfather. It could be a guide or it could be a friend. And I was lucky to have these two men teach me. And, and they taught me in a, 
in an indirect way, I think that was sort of nice about it too. I, I, I often didn't realize that they were teaching me something until much later because they were pretty, for men who are kind of difficult, I think, in their family lives, were very discreet with me. And probably they didn't want to frighten me off so I wouldn't go out with them anymore. They basically needed me to help them kind of do these trips because uh, you need two people to do it. And I, and I think it's, as, and now as I fish more, I love to help other people learn too in a way I never would have thought. And it's, it's really exciting when somebody catches their first trout, you, you have a, a strong feeling. I start, I, I realize now how sometimes adults lose their mind when they're coaching their like kids, little league team. And like, I don't have any kids, but I'm like, get very excited. I'm like, rod tip up. I, and I'm like, and if someone catches this trout, it's like this incredible triumph that, um, that I'm, I'm kind of glad to be able to pass down now too. the same way. Some of these, these lessons were passed down to me. No, and the way you describe your relationship with these guys, I loved how you, you were able to capture how indirect it was. Because I've had that experience too mm. with mentors. I never really had a mentor who just like sat me down and be like, here's the facts, kids. Here's how you do things. <laughs> right, exactly. It was just, they let me <laughs> hang out with, I mean, I, I was just surprised they let me hang out with them. Is like this annoying guy who doesn't really know what he's doing. And then you just, it just sort of rubs off on you. Like what they're doing, you watch, and then they kind of give you some grunts and some like positive affirmation that's very subtle. And then along the way, you, you figure it out. And I don't, it's, it's kind of magic. You, you read these blog posts, like how to be a mentor. I don't, like, I guess the best way to be a mentor is like be like Dave and Carter. Uh, yeah. Ex- my- well, you know, I think, I think what we, we, if somebody's really interested in something and obsessed and loves it, you're going to feel some of that connection. And when you're with somebody on the water, a guide, it's really exciting because they know so much about the fish, of course, but the landscape, about the wildlife, about things, all, all sorts of things that you just kind of absorb from being around them. And so that the first thing you kind of learn is their passion. And then you observe their expert technique. And sometimes it Usually people who are good at something, it looks quite easy the way they do it. So you don't quite appreciate how good it is until you get better at it. And you're like, oh, wait, what they've been doing this whole time that looks simple. It's like, look at a sushi chef. That looks easy as can be. And if you think it's easy, we'll try it and you'll see how, see how easy it is. And so I think you respond to people's passion and their expertise and people who are smart about it communicate their, like, they don't tell you everything at once partly because it will overwhelm you. They give you little advice that they know you can handle. And then they maybe give you some slightly more useful little secret that you can kind of develop and work on the next time for the next time you're fishing or the next time, whatever it is. And that's, you know, I mean, that's a great thing. And, and the way something is passed down, I think something in fishing that's somewhat profound is that you're under trying to understand the natural world and you kind of preserve it in some way. And that, preservation happens from acts of, of love. And if you love an a- area landscape and you want to protect it, maybe for a selfish reason, because you want to fish there, but also for people who are coming after you. And I think that's a, a noble and worthwhile thing. Do you think um, for like our young listeners, like in their twenties and they're like, man, I could use a mentor. Like, can you proactively find a mentor? What do you think? Or is it, do you have to kind of magically find them, like fall into well, them? I think, I, you know, it's funny, by the time you realize you want one, often I think young people, I mean, really, I mean, teenagers, like you you might be afraid of, it's intimidating if it's a friend of your grandfather's because you're used to their being authoritative or maybe they're gruff or they talk a certain way. But I, my, my feeling with anybody is if you care about something or you're curious about something and you see an older person who's good at it, whether they're a writer or an angler or a cook or whatever it is, a painter and you if you like that and you are open and you can kind of keep your mouth shut around them <laughs> and let them talk to you they they'll help you I, I mean that's been my experience and that experience has been very important i've had very important writers and editors in my life who are older than me my father was a, a very good editor for me and taught me things about everything i i know basically not about writing about just about living and i think that if People who even rough son of a guns and that's sort of the image of an old angler, but those guys will teach you and you, you just want to kind of be present, try to pay attention to what they have to say, try to be helpful. And I'll tell you something about f- uh, fishermen. They, they need someone to go with them. They need someone to row the boat and to drive the shuttle and to do all this stuff. So it's in their interest too. So, you know, you show up with a six pack and, you know, I think if you, depending on where you live, if you're lucky, maybe you, you and a friend get a guide 
a hire a guy to, to go out with. And that's, you know, an investment, but you learn so much and you see if you like it and then you can, you can kind of go from there. So with all the trips you highlight in the book, and we talked mm. about this earlier, you know, fishing isn't just the fishing, it's the the getting ready for the fishing. Mm. And that was probably some of my favorite parts because you talk about, <laughs> you get into detail of like the the gear you were buying for the sure. trip and like the eBay trips, you know, visits to eBay you'd make. And then you got into of like course. detail, like you've, you've got your car, the back of your car packed yeah. <laughs> so you can be ready for a fishing trip at it. You said the drop of a yeah. hat. So yeah. why do you, I mean, I think guys really like this. Like, what is it about like gear that guys, I mean, like I have an appreciation for, I'll probably never become a fly fisherman, but like, I really appreciated your well-stocked car. So what's going on there? <laughs> well, the, the reason I think men like that sort of thing anyway. You know, I I have my friends who have 8,000 different cameras. And I think it's it's specific to fishing because so much in fishing is out of our control that having the correct gear gives us the illusion of control or a minimum, just as much control as we can have. I mean, that's why people who love to fish are constantly reading articles and watching videos and and listening to podcasts and constantly trying to hoard advice because it's very hard for us to admit how little control we have. And having said that, the gear is great. You, you know, I, I love finding old, particularly like the Patagonia wading jackets from the 80s and 90s are just so cool and really old wading boots that I, I just like the style of. And you can you have very specific bags. And I've had bags retrofitted in some way because I want them a certain way. I like old fly boxes. And then some of that old stuff has not been improved upon. And then some of it has been. And then you have naturally have to get the new... <laughs> the new reels or the new rods. And sometimes the old ones work just as well, which is pretty fun to have something that maybe your grandfather had. Oh, and sometimes it's nice to have kind of the latest technology and there's some pretty amazing new reels. So you can kind of, it does give people who are obsessed with this sort of thing, a whole whole roads to go down. And, it, and if you think I'm the only one, go on to fly, eBay fly fishing because there's a whole <laughs> insane number of people all over the world looking for this stuff. And again, gear selection can highlight or reveal someone's <laughs> principles of fly fishing of because course. there's you talk about like there's people who could just like they're going to use just canvas, the old stuff from like the right. 40s. But then there's some people who are like, no, I'm going to get like the latest 21st century material stuff. And I'm sure there's some snootiness going on there. It's like, well, that guy using the new stuff, that's kind of cheating. It's like using a a streamer. Right. No, it's 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 so funny because you I didn't realize this when I started, but there is a, a complete, like any any kind of subculture, there's these hierarchies and ways that the experts can kind of tell if you're new. So if if somebody shows up on a fishing trip and he he doesn't fish a lot, and he but he's he's spent a lot of money on this trip and he's got all the latest gear, but it's never been used. So like the rod handle has no kind of sweat stain on it, and and the guides are kind of like rolling their eyes, thinking that this guy's got the latest and greatest, and that's going to save him. If you can't cast, it doesn't matter if you've got a $800 fly rod. But at the same time, I think all of these things express some are some way we imagine we like what we want about form and function. And sometimes I, I, I make the mistake of trying to have old wax canvas jackets and cool old barbers that were only released in England. And then you're like, wait a minute, does this even work in the rain? I'm like, well, so what does my principle get me? It gets me wet. So then you go to Patagonia and you get some lightweight thing, or you, you try to find some some combination of of something that works, something that reflects your personality, then you say, well, you know, for a long time, I had not expensive gear at all. And I, I didn't feel comfortable if my rod was expensive or something. And I didn't think I needed it. And I honestly couldn't tell the difference. And then you move to a different point in your life. And maybe you've worked a little bit with a fishing company and they're like, here, try this fancy rod. And you're like, hey, now I, I can get used to this. But, you know, sometimes you have one that isn't it. You break a rod or all this other stuff happens. And so you you want to enjoy it. You want to have something you like, you want to get into the design and kind of get a little bit too obsessed. And then also you don't want to take it too seriously, but it's usually too late once once you go down the path. I mean, if, when I go on a trip with someone for weeks before I'm like sending them things that I think they might need at, from eBay and, you know, flasks and just random, you know, cool old flashlights and, and different types of like water bottles from Switzerland from the 1920s and stuff that I just think would be fun to have. And it is fun. Are there people who fly fish in like tweed coats? Is that well, a, is that a thing? So th- th- I, you know, it's funny because I I love a tweed coat, and I I do draw a line there myself. The, you know, the sport began in England and and kind of 
wealthy people's estates and and they did actually wear tweed coats and kind of and fish from the bank so they didn't even go into the water they didn't wade so they could wear their country clothes you might call them while they fished with a you know a, a bamboo rod and they would sit down and smoke a pipe and you know if you go to england that's still how it's done you don't wear those clothes necessarily but you don't you don't wear waders the way we think of it the streams are very kind of manicured and often there's mode on both sides it's very it's a different feeling and i really really love a tweed jacket but i can't quite bring myself to wear a tweed jacket to fish in but i don't judge anyone who does and and also traditionally they men anglers wore ties because the trout especially the brown trout is a gentleman of fish and so you would dress well to show respect when you tried to fish for him and you know most americans completely disregard that and understandably so but that's that's kind of how the the sport began is a it's it's become democratized over the years but if you go to england it's still kind of done that way so one thing you you, you show throughout the book is that you know, with fishing, you're never guaranteed a fish, right? It's, you can do, you can get all the gear, mm. you can plan perfectly, you can have the perfect yeah. cast and you don't catch anything. So like, what have you learned about failure from fishing? <laughs> well, it's about failure. The sport in many ways is about coming to terms with not getting what you want. And then that makes, that makes a philosopher out of you. Even a, even an entry philosopher 101, a college level philosopher, it does something to you. And I think that that's worthwhile, honestly. And I have been on many trips. I mean, there's, and there's different levels of heartbreak. There's just, oh my goodness, the weather up front came through the di- whole day's awful and you know, it's bad. And that it's like when your team starts out and you're like, this is just a lost season. Our team's terrible. Then there's a different way when you think you have a fish, you're at the last moment and you lose it. And that's like your team almost making the playoffs. And then that unravels and that's a heartbreak in a different way. And you, it's hard because sometimes it's your fault and you know it. Sometimes you can't explain it. Sometimes it's physics. You look around and sometimes you're alone. No one can tell you a guide or someone can give you advice about how to change that the next time. And I think having coming to terms with that is kind of what makes you an adult, to be honest. And that's why it's a sport for adults ultimately, because it, it tells you what you need. Why, why, why do you need that certain validation? But then of course you do need it sometimes, which is also m- maybe humbling in some way. I mean, I was just on a trip to kind of celebrate the book. I was in the Bahamas on my own, the happiest place I could be on the flats and it was a really great day. I mean, the last day, incredible. Everything was wonderful. I was feeling like very triumphant. I was about to go back and have a, a glass of rum and, and just listen to Bob Marley and like, you know, deal with my sunburn. And we stop at one last place. There's five minutes left. The day has been perfect. And all of a sudden we see a fish, which was in itself a surprise. I make a good cast, hook the fish, huge fish. The guide's like, that's a big fish. And just as he's saying, that's a big fish, which he doesn't normally say, I'd made a little, like my line got caught around my reel. So when the fish went on a run, I lost it right away. And so 10 minutes before I was like, this is the perfect day. Now at the very end of the trip, I'm like, wait a minute, I got a little bit of a funny taste in my mouth. I just lost that last fish. Like, but I didn't even know about the fish 10 minutes before. So that, then I was thinking, well, what do I want from this? Why do I need that? When I had all these other things, I was perfectly happy. If we had never seen that fish, it wouldn't have mattered. But because I had made a mistake, a mistake that I flatter myself, I don't normally make, which is a terrible thing to hear yourself say. I never make this type of mistake when you do it. And then you're like, hmm, what? now I've got a different feeling. And it's, it's you know, it's humbling. I, I've got to think about it for the entire flight back. I'm still thinking about no, it. No, there's a lot of metaphors for life there. I think we've all had that experience where <laughs> right, you, you were perfectly happy and then you saw this thing, I right. want it, and you don't get it, and <laughs> right. now you're just miserable. <laughs> right, right. I, and, I, and then, but the fact that I know that it's happening makes it way worse because like, I also think I'm like, let's keep it in perspective. Nothing can ruin this. And then you're like, wait a minute. And it, and it didn't. And I was, you know, it, it, gave, it was half an hour of sort of consternation. And, you know, you laugh with the guy and you say, I'll see you next year, man. I'll be thinking about you like keep your eye out for that fish and and that's you know you've got to embrace the irrationality i think of it and and i think what i love about anglers who are often you know crusty old guys is like there's still this both sense of optimism that they believe they're going to catch the fish and they still do it again and again you've got to believe but also you've suffered or lost in some way and so you have this kind of scar tissue or this heartbreak 
and that that makes you a little bit wistful. And I like that quality in people. And I think that that's, that's a good thing to have. And I think anybody who, no, not really a golfer, but like golf is a very hard sport. Right. And so people remember lipping out putts or they were this close. And I, and I understand that, that kind of <laughs> exquisite aggravation that they feel. And I sympathize with that. I think there's a, that's a kind of universal feeling. And honestly, I think hopefully this book can connect with people like you who don't fish, but who understand the nature of obsession or who uh, care about building a skill over time, who measure themselves against something that they care about, even if that skill doesn't have any actual implication other than the meaning we bring to it. And so hopefully the book can connect with people about in, in that way. Well, it did. And like, you know, you talked about that optimism. That's the name of the book is called The Optimist. Like you say right. angling is it's an act of faith. Every time you go, yeah. you're having faith that something's going to happen. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, you have to. I mean, I think like I, the, there's definitely something in where you talk to your friend and you're like, is this a good, have you, you know, it's like when you go to the next bar when you're a younger guy, right. And then somehow you end up somewhere at five in the morning and it made sense at the time. And like, that's kind of fishing in some way. It's sort of, it made sense, but the time when it made sense was sort of a few bars ago, a few hours ago. And I think that that act of faith is, I, I like it. I'm attracted to it. I like people who feel that way. And, and also I think it's an actual, a little bit chemical addiction <laughs> because the same when a fly is floating over where you know a fish is, you do get a, an incredible rush. The same way somebody would get a rush if they're scratching off a lottery ticket. That that chemi- chemistry is very similar, and um, and it doesn't last. And you don't win the lottery, and you usually don't catch the fish. But that's all right. You know, I loved how honest you were with you know your <laughs> writing about failure because, like, I think a lot of times you know you say a lot of fishermen. Well, you know, it's not the 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 fishing that counts it's the experience and yeah and right. you said yeah but i i want to catch a fish <laughs> like i've had that i've had that moment where i'm like you know lecturing my son about oh well it's not whether you lose win or lose it's how you play the game right. but sure. i like deep down like no it's it's fun to win um that's <laughs> and like you say that's completely fine you don't have to be philosophical and sort of this stoic about your failures right i mean try to be but like it's okay to like want to catch a fish that's completely fine right Well, yeah, it's like we, it's all very human. Like ultimately all of these things are human. And, and I think that we, we see, recognize our different, you know, when you start to fish, like there are actually specific things you can do with kids to try to get them into the sport. So that would be like fishing for panfish, like a, a bluegill or a perch, because those are really easy fish to catch on a fly rod. And there's a lot of action and it kind of gets kids going. That's a good way for, for like, 10 or 12 year olds to, to start. And that's natural. That's completely natural. And then there's something about either your personality is such that you like to do something that's slightly more difficult or your personality is not like that, <laughs> or it, you give yourself time and maybe it, you're not that way when you're 25, but when you're 35, you just like something that's a little more methodical. And that's, I think fly fishing is an easy way to kind of understand where we are in our lives. And that, and that's a good thing. And I have friends who fly fish and they want to catch fish. And even though they like to, you know, they're fly fishing, but like they want action and they want to fish in a way that gets them action. And there are of course ways to do that. And then other people just want to be in a beautiful place. They want to catch a wild fish, a native fish that grew up in that place. And they don't care how big or small it is. And, and they want some other kind of some other experience from it. And maybe they want to catch it on a, um, fly that they've made themselves maybe they don't even want to catch it they just want the fish to come and take the fly so that shows that maybe that's the moment the same way some people who hunt for turkeys or just want to call and have the turkey respond to the call they don't necessarily want to shoot them and sometimes you want to you just want to test a certain part of your own kind of arsenal of skills and that that happens when you've done it a lot more and you've caught a lot of fish then you don't catching them you want to do it a certain way and that's part of the sport too and and a good part of it yeah, and that's part of life. It's figuring out what you want. Yeah, right. exactly. And this, this carries over to that, your your uh, book about style. That was kind of what it, you don't ha- like. Your style book wasn't like here's what you need to wear. It was like figure right. out what you want, figure out your style, and go with that. And sure. Like, I think that's pretty much life is figure out what works for you. So uh, fishing is often a solitary thing. You went on a lot of mm. fishing trips on your own. Like you just went to the Bahamas by yourself. But you also yeah. you can fish with friends. It's kind of the stereotypical, oh, yeah. archetypical like. Going on a fishing trip with my buddies. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
How does fishing with a friend change the dynamic bet- with the fishing, but also with the friendship? Uh, oh, well, so I always joke that the most important women in my life, of course, are like my sister and my girlfriend, but also the wives of my friends, <laughs> because the wives of my friends, are, they're the ones who ultimately decide if they can go on fishing trips with me. So I always try to stay on good terms with them because it's usually the guys who are coming with me. And, you know, fishing with a friend is a really great thing. I mean, to me, like, I don't, I'm not competitive about fishing. I fish with some incredible anglers who, you know, like do things that I cannot dream of doing. And I don't get upset about that. I like watching them. I'm inspired by them the same way I was inspired by Dave and Carter. Different things are at stake for different people. It's like a golf handicap. And then now I have friends who are beginning and I just am happy to be out with them. I'm happy to spend time with them, especially as they have families and it gets harder to do that. Like there are no more kind of dirt bagging road trips across Montana. Now it's like a day or two. And I really value those days. And, you know, you want them to succeed if you, if you, especially if it's your kind of trip and you've planned it, you want them to catch fish. You want them to be happy. You also want it like the planning is fun too. And like, should we bring a fancy bottle of scotch and should, who's going to bring the cigars and I'll bring these flies. And I know a great guide and we got to stop at this bar. And then, you know, in a perfect world, everyone catches fish about the same numbers and sometimes they don't. And then you got, you can navigate it from there and you try to give someone an advantage and they're in the front of the boat if you're floating, cause then they had a better shot. And then sometimes you switch around and I mean, it's, it's pretty funny if you go bone fishing and you need, you can't have clouds because you need the sun to see the fish. And it's also complicated if there's a lot of wind, it's just very hard to cast. And usually like one person fishes at a time. So one person's up in the bow and when you and then you get a chance at a fish, and if you mess it up, then you sit down. Your friend goes up there, and as soon as he gets up there, like the sky clears up, the wind dies down, the fish seems seems like much easier, and you're like, "What's going on here?" Of course, you're like, "God is taking his side," but you know, psychological things like that happen. But it's still just great to be with your friends, and hopefully, in a perfect world, you start a tradition and you do you like cut out these days, and you go to Maine with one friend, or you go to the Bahamas with friends, and and sometimes like I got invited on the trip because someone canceled at the last minute, and then it started a whole new tradition that I didn't even expect. I was just the spare guy, and the next thing I know, I'm like completely obsessed with the Bahamas, and I couldn't stop going. No, and you also it's you, fishing with friends also highlights the dynamic how it's easier to you know be philosophical about fly fishing when someone else is having a hard time, but then of when course. it's you. You're like, yeah, this sucks. I mean, you talked about you went on a, f- a trip with your friend Andrew and you're hoping it would be a really good yeah. trip. And like, he wasn't catching anything. You're like, well, you know, you're doing everything right. And like, it's the experience <laughs> right. that matters. And then he started catching fish and you weren't catching fish. And all of a sudden you were no longer a philosopher. You were, you were getting upset about right. this. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. So this was a classic example of my friend, Andrew, who's, you know, he's got a wife and kids, very busy life. And so I somehow managed to pry him away from all this to go to the main North woods. And he, he doesn't fish too much, but is, you know, to, because he's, he's got all that full, full life. And so he was struggling a little bit and I felt badly. And what we were doing was pretty hard anyway. And it was just difficult. And I was saying all these, you know, serving up these platitudes right and left, and I'm sure I was completely, you know, exhausting for him to, to try to cheer him up. And then all of a sudden he starts catching the one fish after another and I'm sort of not catching him. And it's like, what's happening here? And, 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 then, I, and then he was too polite to start using any of this philosophizing back on me. But um, it was, you know, it's good to do that. And it's good to have those experiences where somebody, you know, you can laugh about it or something happens that's crazy and somebody's whatever falls in the river. And, and it's, it's nice to be able to share that with someone else. So you, uh, you finally make it to England. And as you said, this is like, this is where the sport yes. began. And this was a big deal for you. Actually, you purposely like waited to make this trip to yeah. England. Uh, you wanted to make sure you got your education as much as you could polish your skills here in America. You go to England. What did you learn about fly fishing by fishing in the, the sports birthplace? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's funny when you, when you start to, to really care about something and want to make these pilgrimages, you, you kind of want to be ready for it to do your part. And this got very complicated because the book was, you know, the book was being written and then COVID happened. So to, to go there and the last thing place I was supposed to go was England. So I, I went there last summer 
if I didn't go, the whole book would have been postponed for you. It would have been a very complicated situation. And I, I quarantined. So the first thing I learned, I quarantined for two weeks so I could fish for four days. So that basically tells me I'm insane, but that's all right. And it was in the English countryside. It was actually quite, quite beautiful and, and a good time to be there and stayed in a, in a farmhouse with my girlfriend. And then I was, you know, it's funny when you, when you do anything as you get older, you, you both, you, I don't know if I want it to be demystified or if I still want to have these illusions about it. And I, I learned that it was very challenging. I was there at kind of the wrong time, partly because of COVID. So I already had my excuses about why I wasn't going to catch fish. But it was, it, it's it, the sport operates at a different pace there, and it's funny. You know, I'm I like England a lot. I've spent a fair amount of time there. But it you you don't. They have a slightly less democratic way than than you have fishing. The, the water's not public. Basically, you have to pay a landowner to to fish a specific section of of a river, a beat. It's called. And, and it's much more, I guess you'd say gentlemanly and that's absolutely not for everyone, but it's still pretty fun for a few days. And uh, it was, I got there and after waiting all this time, it was the fishing, the conditions were really rough and I was kind of getting frustrated, even though I knew all of this thing. I've just been writing a book, been totally obsessed about perspective and the long view and you can't put too much emphasis on one hour or even one day. And like, that just wasn't getting me very far. <laughs> I was, uh, I still want, I, this is where you're like, I want to catch a fish, but the fish basically weren't rising and it was too late in the season. And there, it was, you can't use certain tactics there. And finally on a famous river, but I don't want to give away too much, but it, 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 cause this is the very end of the book, but it, it, it aligns all right. And, and I, I did okay. And I, I left with my pride intact. But I was, but I was embarrassed to admit it mattered so much to me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, no, that's, that's part fine. of the thing. Yeah. It's like, it's that you, you both, you, you know, it shouldn't matter. And then of course it matters. And, and, and I think coming to terms with that dynamic is, is a very human moment. And, and, and that can happen in anything. Like you can say, I, how much success do I want in my life? And it shouldn't matter, but it does. Or it, how many, how much does this matter? But it doesn't. And, and you, and you try to navigate that. And that's a real moment of self-knowledge. Yeah, learning to care but not care. That's it's tricky. <laughs> right. It's 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 a tough one and it's not always flattering either. <laughs> so for those who are, you know, they're listening to this like, man, I want to become an angler. Like what's the best way? Is it just to go hire a guide somewhere? And- you know, in in a perfect world, what I what I would do with if you know, a lot of things depend on, you know, as we call it the current situation, but it, what I would what I recommend to people is to pick a weekend and try to hire a guide and go with a friend. And so you're like splitting the cost, right? And hire a guide for a day. And that guide will have gear. Don't, even though I love all the gear, don't get caught up in getting rods and reels and waders and all that stuff. It's too, it's too complicated. You don't know. It's too much of a, it'll keep you from doing it. You get a guide for a day. And if you've got a second day, you can rent that gear from him and go kind of back to nearby water and, and give it a shot on your own with your friend. And then you've got it. You've had this nice, you know, in a perfect world. Maybe you get the guide both days, but that gets a little more expensive. And and that's a way that you're you you want to be on the water one day with an expert. That just is is honestly accelerates everything a, by a year of you just being on your own. Once you do that, then you can start worrying more about learning to cast better, kind of what line management, as we say, and a few other things. And so I, I think it's great to do it with a friend because then you've got someone to kind of, that you learn with, that you can start traditions with, and and that you you make these trips with, and and or your dad or your your son or whomever it is, somebody that, or daughter for that matter, would probably be better fishermen than, than her dad in no time. And, um, or couples, I, I don't want to act. I mean, women learn fly fishing much faster than men. That's just a basic fact as any guide will tell you. And so I do think that that's like, even though the gear is fun, I, I think slow down on that, try to get on the water with someone who really knows Orvis has these schools that they're kind of bringing them back. They, they were slowed down because of COVID. Those are really good to do and, and fish near you. You know, it doesn't have to be trout fishing. There's great ways to fly fish all over the country, whether it's for stripers, whether it's for redfish, whether it's for smallmouth bass. And, and I think it's good to, I mean, it's great to go to Montana, or Idaho and do that, but you want to have a place that you can go within a few hours of your house and nearly everywhere in America, there's good fly fishing two hours away. I think that was a, that's a good point because I think a lot of people, they think fly fishing is, 
it's if you got to fly, it's got to be it's going to be expensive. You got to buy all this expensive gear. You got to travel. But you even said yeah. like my favorite. You've been to all these great places, but you said your favorite spot to fish is like in New York somewhere. Yeah, I mean, there, you're going to have different connections to different places. You know, also it's like you know you go to a fancy restaurant sometimes, and that's maybe good once a year. And then there's a place you go all the time that you that you like because of the way it is. So I, I fish in the Catskills. That's my you know local water, my home water. And I, you know, I love it at different times of year and I can see it as it changes. And, you know, fishing is about being outside, like in the simplest way. You're in a, usually in a beautiful place, not staring at your cell phone. And that's, that's a good thing. You're, you're already, you're already doing the right, you already started your day right already. And, and I think it's, I, I love all the kind of mythology around the sport, but I also think it keeps people from getting into it. And, um, and that's too bad because getting into it is, is, a, is, is a good thing to do. Well, David, where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? You know, I'm, I've got, I'm in the little e- media ecosystem now too. You can li- subscribe to my God, newsletter. This is how long it's been since I've talked to you. I've got a newsletter, uh, The Contender on Substack, but you can, you can find my book. You can order it from your local bookstore, which is a good way to do it, or you can order it from the usual suspects. And uh, you can find me on Instagram where I'll, I link to all this nonsense at David R. Coggins. It's always great to talk to you, Brett. I really appreciate it. Likewise, David Coggins, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. My guest today was David Coggins. He's the author of the book, The Optimist, A Case for the Fly Fishing Life. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his Substack, thecontender.substack.com. Check it out. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash flyfish, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.